All right. They say we're supposed to start exactly on time, so I guess I will try to do that for the first session of the day. My name is Debbie Ginsberg. I'm the Educational Technology Librarian at Chicago Kent. And over the last, well, I'll say the year for the purposes of this conference, I've been really fascinated with surveys because I've found that I can use surveys to get things done. And the reason I, I kept doing a lot of surveys in the last year is I kept having questions, and I had questions that I wanted to ask a lot of different people, but not necessarily just go face to face with them, or maybe call them on the phone, or I didn't, in some cases, even know them. And I had questions like, are students using, using e case books? So one of our deans walked up to me one day and said, Well, is that taking off yet? I see West is advertising. What's going on with these e case books? I had no idea. So I took a survey and I asked the students, are you using e-case books? We're planning classroom technology upgrades. And of course, one of the most important people who need to buy into your classroom technology upgrades are the faculty. So we surveyed the faculty about what kinds of technology that they wanted in their classroom. So that could be part of the decision-making process. It's not solely determinative, but it helped. And finally, those of you on technoids or have seen what's advanced in today's program at uh, later, we're going to be talking about the results of the Educational Technologist Survey. We wanted to know what law school educational technologists were doing today. And through surveys, I found out the answers to all of these. From the students, I found out the students aren't yet using e-case books, not in our law school, but they'd really like to. They, they don't want to carry on giant backpacks anymore. I found out that some faculty want lots of technology in the classroom and other faculty are just as happy to keep using chalk. And as far as the answers to the Educational Technologist Survey, we'll tell you more about those at 2.30. So the big thing about surveys and making sure that you have a successful survey that gets you the information that you want and you need to get the results that you want and you need is to do a lot of planning and developing. So I'm going to spend most of this talk focused on planning and developing the questions from the surveys. Of course, there's another part of any survey. You're going to send out the survey, but once you have the survey, you want to know what to do with the results. I'm going to talk a little bit less about those because that would take a very long time, but I, we will touch on it a little bit. So the big question for any survey is why. Why are we going to do the survey? What, uh, why are we asking the questions? And I broke down why into two big questions. One, why do we care about the survey and why do we care about the survey process at all? Any of us can start a survey, right? We can open up Microsoft Word or our favorite text editor and just write a bunch of questions and send them out to people on email and that's a survey, right? But I'm going to hopefully give you some tools that you can work with to create surveys that are a little more targeted and um, can help you a little bit more. The other reason, of course, is why do a survey at all? I can get the answers I want just by talking to people. Um, but I think surveys are becoming a little more prevalent for different reasons. One is, in our law school, we're seeing a lot more faculty who are interested in giving surveys themselves. Are any of you seeing more faculty? Raise your hand if, you're, if you think you're seeing more faculty in your law school interested in giving other surveys. So a few people were starting to see this. You've seen the interest in empirical legal research. Northwestern has done the conferences on empirical legal research. There's two aspects of this, of course. There's the getting the understanding and the mining of the data. But first thing that they need to do, and they're coming to us with questions about this, is how do we form the surveys themselves? What kinds of questions do we ask? What kinds of tools are available? And so they're looking for help with those kinds of issues. Second is we're finding surveys are really helpful to establish maybe short-term strategy or long-term goals. We have a library service. Is it still being used? We can use a survey to find that out. We, um, as I said, we're planning for upgrades in classroom technology. And we, you know, we can ask a wide, about a wide range. Some technologies we can get later. If we see an increasing interest, we may add techno other technologies down the line based on the results of the surveys. And the reason why we want to take some care in asking good questions and in um, making sure we're asking the right people at the right time uh, with the right tools is because we want the data to be accurate. We want to make sure that we're getting the answers that actually reflect what's going on. And it's little things that we're finding make a difference. For example, the faculty are reporting to me that timing makes a big difference for sending out some of their surveys. If they're sending out surveys to a general population through um, a large 
to a large group of people, they find that if they send it out during the business day for um, the Western Hemisphere, they get Western Hemisphere respondents. And if they send it out during the business day for the Eastern Hemisphere, they get Eastern Hemisphere respondents. So even minute detail planning like that will make a big difference. And as far as just even just making sure you're thinking about your questions, I did ask two questions of our faculty at about a year and a half of each other. We did some preliminary studies about faculty technology, and I asked them, if a document camera were available, would you be interested? And they said, oh, we're not that interested, and I looked at the comments. And the reason why it looked like the faculty didn't have a lot of interest is they didn't know what a document camera was. I had made an assumption they understood what a document camera was, and when I asked them about it, they said, well, no, why would, why would I want something I don't even know what it does? When we did a more extensive questionnaire about a year and a half later, and I guarantee there wasn't a giant leap of interest in document cameras in 18 months, I asked them if they wanted to mark up printouts of documents or show physical objects with a document camera. So I made sure up front I explained what the action was that they were going to do. I had reformulated the question so that it made sense to them, and interest jumped up significantly because now they said, oh, this is something I can actually use for teaching. The other why that's really important for surveys, you have to figure out what, what you want your survey to do. And different surveys can, of course, do different things. So are you doing surveys to come up with a new direction for what you want your library or your IT department to go in? Are you looking for trends so you can figure out what kinds of new technologies maybe your students are bringing in so you can figure out how to provide resources that use the technologies and resources to support the technologies? Um, feedback is a common reason we do surveys. How are you liking us? Lots, we do surveys to justify, okay, we want to do upgrades in classroom technology, but we have to justify the particular upgrades that we did. We've got data that support what we've decided to do. I'm also seeing a lot of faculty, as I mentioned, do surveys not just for research, but they're also using surveys to assess what's going on in their classrooms. Now, some faculty are using it to say, hey, is this part of the class working for you? Are these readings working for you or not? But an interesting experiment one of our faculty tried this year is she used a survey instrument to send out to her class to say, are you agreeing with the um, majority or the dissent in these Supreme Court cases? And they looked at some cases over time to see if they, uh, students were responding to a particular legislative theory that was uh, present in either the majority or the dissent, depending on what case. And they got to see if there was a trend over time. So those are the kinds of reasons we're seeing a lot of people do surveys these days. If you notice the kinds of questions I'm asking, you can plan surveys as if, you're, uh, have project, uh, as if it's a project. If you have basic project planning skills, you can do that. If you're not familiar with the concept of uh, project planning, your basic journalist questions can work too. Who, what, when, where, why, and how. So we're covering most of those because that will provide the foundation for planning any survey. And the more planning you do, the better your questions and the better results you're going to get. So the next question I had was, who is going to do all the work on the survey? And of course, there's two aspects of that work. You want to know who's going to create the survey, and there's lots that can go into that. Who's going to write up the questions? Who's going to do the testing? Who's going to do the analysis? Who, uh, that's the work that's on our part. But one of the big questions that people uh, can, need, also need to keep in mind is who's going to take the survey. Now, for many of us, we may be doing surveys among very set audiences, our students, our faculty, our alumni. But um, our faculty, when they do surveys, may have other kinds of audiences in mind. Some are surveying their students, and some are looking for very specific demographics that they want to reach. And they, they're thinking about how those demographics are going to reflect in the data that they're gathering. So some want to address everybody they can get, as wide a demographic audience as they can. Others have come up with things like local administrative assistance, Female, female administrative assistants in our local law firm, so very specific kinds of people that they're thinking about. And that's going to also tell us what we need to do with our surveys later. Uh, where is an interesting question, and that's just where you're going to give the survey. I'm mostly focusing on giving online surveys that you might post on a website or send out an email. Some people, of course, you've gotten your uh, surveys on the telephone. Some people like doing surveys face-to-face -face with people, going out with forms and interviewing people. It takes a long time, but you can get some really interesting data. And, of course, you always have your um, form that you can leave out that people fill out. What fascinating about this example that I found is it's a web content questionnaire that somebody put on, on a form. And to me, it strikes me that how am I supposed to answer questions about web content when I'm not on your website? <laughs> 
So the where is actually a really important question because you want to be asking the right questions in the right place. And if you're not in a place that makes sense, your data might not be as good. When is pretty important because we want to think about the timeline. And there's a lot of different parts of the survey that we have to consider when we are planning to do a survey. Again, I can type up a bunch of questions in Microsoft Word and save it and send it out on email and read it the next day and create a graph, but I'm probably not going to get great answers that way. So I do want some time to do what we're doing now, which is do general planning, draft it up. Testing becomes very important. If I had tested that original question about document cameras more thoroughly, I might have seen that, hey, my audience doesn't know what a document camera is, and I need to make sure that question's a little more clear. And then, of course, you want time to edit it, so that's the whole creation. Then you want time to distribute the survey. You want enough time for people to take the survey, uh, not enough so much time the survey gets stale. So sometimes people leave st surveys out for a month. In certain cases, that may be too much. A day may be too short. It depends on the nature of the survey and the audience that you're trying to reach. And of course, you want some time to analyze it. it depends on the, how much data you're getting and to draw up some kind of report. All of this stuff that I've been talking about so far is something that's generally under our control. Those of us who are coming up with a survey, we can decide how much time we want to devote to the creation process and the distribution of analysis process. But in the middle, I've put something called the IRB. Does anyone know what the IRB is? The Institutional Review Board. Has anyone ever submitted something to the Institutional Review Board? How long did it take? That's short. The Institutional Review Board. Yes, and I've heard of stories of things that take uh, whole students, of course, also have to submit surveys. I'll get into more detail about that. And for some students, it might take as long as their entire academic career to get something approved. That is out of your control. Um, and so we'll talk about what it is that uh, the IRB does and why it is that it's important to consider it during your survey process. So as mentioned, the IRB is the Institutional Review Board. Well, what is the Institutional Review Board? Well. Uh, that's the Wikipedia definition, which I like as much as anything, but um, let's focus on some of the important words. The review board, it's a committee, so it's a group of people in your institution, and I think almost every single institution is required to have some kind of committee because you get federal funding, and that committee's job is to evaluate research that's being done on the campus. So that's their job. They're, they need to monitor what's going on. And they're particularly interested in research involving humans. So if you're doing research that involves dead people, not the province of the IRB. If you're doing research involving uh, data that's already been collected, not their province either. But if you are doing research where you are contacting some other person, either by phone or by email or through the web or face to face, then that becomes something that they're concerned with. So any contact starts to trigger the policies of a typical institutional review board. And the reason why they, we have the IRBs is they want to protect the welfare of the people who are being researched. So they want to make sure that the research that's being done meets certain ethical and um, federal guidelines. The reason why this is, uh, we uh, have this is because, of course, it's quite possible to do research that's unethical that can cause problems for people in the long run. So even if you think of something basic, like, oh, I want to ask students about their illegal downloads, if you do it in such a way so the students can be identified, that can cause them problems in the long run. And there's a lot of emphasis when dealing with the IRD, IRB about protecting people from risks and protecting their confidentiality. And there's a big history of really bad research, mostly in the biomedical uh, era. So we've heard of like, you know, the Nazi experiments or the Tuskegee syphilis experiment that happened that went up until the 1970s. This was problematic on a number of different levels. It tracked the progression of untreated syphilis in poor rural black men who thought they were free, uh, receiving free health care. Well, okay, so this experiment is bad on a number of different reasons that would be stopped by an IRB today. One, it's uh, not treating syphilis. Well, by the time these experiments ended, there was a treatment for syphilis. And so there was no benefit, no reason to consider this experiment. They weren't learning anything new that was going to be very helpful. 
They were, uh, had targeted a population that wasn't able to get a lot of information, poor rural black men, so they couldn't really make good decisions about what was going on because they couldn't get the information. And not only that, but they were deceived. They thought they were getting free health care. Obviously, deception can play a place in certain kinds of research, but that has to be monitored very carefully right now. So on the basis of experiments like this, the government had uh, started to form the IRBs. They came up with regulations, and that's why our institutions now have um, these boards in place. So a typical board consists of five members who need sufficient expertise to make good decisions about what uh, makes for good research protocols in their area, usually has one scientist and one non-scientist, one community member, which means someone who's not from the institution at all, because who is it you're going to be researching from, but p uh, particularly what the faculty are doing and others in your institution, people from the community, they want to say. Uh, and they're not all from the same profession. And what they're looking for are some of the issues I've been talking about so far. They're looking for you to fill out a form. And you can see this one's asking about like people with individual, uh, limited civil uh, freedom. So some research is being done on prisoners, and that's something that I could see law faculty doing. They want to interview prisoners about conditions, about their understanding of the law, but then they would need to be indicating that they, that they are talking to people with limited civil freedom. And they're looking for information about all these issues, and they're balancing it out to make sure that the research meets the correct guidelines. So as I mentioned, are they working on human subjects, working with people? And are those people vulnerable in some way? Uh, are they too young? Are they, uh, do they have health issues? Are they financial reasons why they would be vulnerable? They're making sure that uh, the subjects that you're talking to have conformed consent. They understand what they're being asked and why. They're making sure that their confidentiality is being protected, and I know that in our institutional review board that's very important. So we've got, I've got an example of a faculty member. He's going to go to another country and interview people about labor conditions, and it was very, very important to the institutional review board that the people that he was interviewing, workers, that their uh, information be well protected because there could be repercussions about what they have to say about local labor conditions. Um, political and economic. So they're also looking like something like risks, what could happen, and of course they want to make sure there's some kind of benefit, that the research um, benefits knowledge or the institution or something in some way. It's not just being done for the sake of being done. And that's the kind of thing that they're looking for. Now, what you, whether surveys that you're doing, particularly uh, survey surveys, need to go in front of an institutional review board, probably depends on the, uh, your particular institution. I know for us, a service survey does not need to go in front of an institutional review board. But a survey like the faculty are doing that um, needs to be vetted before they can use it for publication probably does. And I'm seeing more and more of them go before the board to make sure that things are, are going the way that, um, that, yeah, that things are working out, that the survey is good. And sometimes they do have to do some back and forth, and it does break up their timeline about when they hope to do their research. And they're asking us questions about you know, what these procedures are. And uh, that's one of the reasons I think all of us as librarians in IT need to be familiar, and faculty in particular, need to be familiar with it. What are the consequences if we don't go for an IRB? Theoretically, institutions can lose funding. I haven't seen that happen in a law school. But the big consequence, particularly when it comes to research, is you might not be able to publish it. From what I've seen, a lot of law reviews haven't picked up on this. But I guarantee you that outside of law reviews, this is a big thing for publishers. Not that only that, I'm seeing this with a couple of law reviews, well, I guess one law review so far as well. New York University Law Review says that uh, if your manuscript has original research, then you need to provide uh, proof that you've gone before the IRB. Now, I will say that that is a guideline, and if you've got a reason not to do it, then you can talk to them about it, but it is specifically mentioned in their submission guidelines, and faculty who do submit there are probably better off having gone before the Institutional Review Board than not. And if it's starting there, then I think we're going to see this in other law reviews going forward. Everyone ready to submit to an IRB now? A little scary, but they tend to walk you through the process and make sure you know what you're doing. All right, let's get into another fun question, what? And for me, what comes down to what kinds of questions? There are all kinds of different question types that we might want to ask. I mentioned in my uh, blurb for this that, oh, do we need another how am I doing survey? And you know, asking that kind of subjective question can be useful. You can get a lot of good ideas of how people are responding emotionally to your service. But unless you add objective questions to this, what services are you using? Um, 
or add some kind of factual basis, it's not going to work together. So it, having a balance of these can be useful for any survey. Same with open versus closed questions. Uh, open questions like, you know, what kind of technology do you want in a classroom could be useful. Faculty can then list the kinds of technologies they were interested in, but they may not be aware of all the different kinds of technologies. So a closed question, yep, they can click the kinds of technologies, but I may be limited in the number of answers I can provide, or it may be so many answers that the uh, question becomes overwhelming. So again, balancing those two are um, an issue. The big thing to keep in mind, however, with any of these questions, objective versus subjective, open versus closed, your standard question types, is the language that you're using. And the more clear the language, the better the answers you're going to get. You can break down the clarity into four different components. One, is the language comprehensible? Can the people who are taking your survey understand it? Back to the document cameras. I asked about document cameras. That was not a comprehensible term. If I used a different kind of term, then I would have gotten better answers. So it's important that it be comprehensible. Consistent. If you refer to something one way on a survey, keep referring it that way throughout the survey. So you have consistencies of data and consistency of understanding what's going on. So I could have asked about a document camera in one question and an Elmo in another, and that wouldn't have been consistent because they may have been thought, well, I'm specifically referring to that brand. I need to make sure the language is the same. Retrievable. How many times, has anyone come up with an example where you've been asked for like, how many times have you done X in the last year? What did you come up with? Or, yeah, what was the question? Right. Do you remember what you did in the last year? When you're asking questions on a survey, you need to be able to ask questions that people can actually remember. So while you'd like to cover a year, you may need to extrapolate from smaller times. Uh, the last week, the last month, maybe even the last semester. But I guarantee for most questions, have you done X in the last year, they're just not going to be able to remember what they did. And finally, you're going to want to make sure your questions are comfortable. Um, who here has been asked, how much have you earned on a survey? And who here has refused to answer that question? That's not a comfortable question. People don't like being asked how much they earn. It's none of your business. It's embarrassing. You could find out who I am and figure out how much I make. And it's really personal. But if you're, let's say, an alumni group and you need to ask your uh, alumni how much you earn for the purposes of telling law st future law students, you're going to have to find a way to ask that question. One recommendation I've seen for that kind of question is to break it up um, in such a way so you're asking about something or less. Have, do you earn $75,000 or less? Do you earn $50,000 or less? Do you earn $25,000 or less? And apparently, uh, respondents are a little more comfortable asking that rather than just a straight salary line or specific ranges. All right, and now that we've considered everything else, we've considered who we're asking and why we're asking the question and what kind of um, format we're going to use for our survey and uh, what kind of the language we're going to use to ask questions. Now we can get to the question types, the fun part, especially if you're playing with online surveys. And we've all seen different kinds of question types. I'll review them briefly. So if you've got an open question, you might be using a text entry. Here's some typical results. So in this version that I found, uh, someone had asked some programmers what they hope to learn from the class. And that's a great thing that a faculty member might ask, what do you want to learn? And a great open question because there's all kinds of different answers. Uh, these people are a little vague. They say they want to learn how to write code. Here they say they want to learn something useful, so I hope they got something useful. In the next question, they used a multiple choice. And you've got different uh, options for multiple choice questions. Remember, they do limit the options, so pick things where you want the options to be limited. And sometimes you, they're going, you want to uh, have them answer just one thing, particularly in a yes, no, or maybe situation. And sometimes you may want them to answer many different things. This question I actually kind of criticized because I think they should have done, flipped it and done the other way. They've asked a fixed yes, no, or maybe when they should have used uh, multiple because they're asking, do you want to use XML, CSS, PHP, interactive programming, and more about software engineer? Five different things covered in one question. Bad language. It's not comprehensible what's being asked. If they broke it down, do you want to learn these five things with a yes or a no or just a check mark next to it, then they would have gotten better data because that a bunch of people answered maybe indicates there was some 
lack of clarity to the question. Finally, in the survey, they did a matrix, and those are another common survey uh, question we see. And this is actually kind of interesting. They said, okay, what do you like about uh, programming? And they found that they kind of like writing code, and that they love running the program. They like seeing the results. So if I was write, writing this class, if I was running this class, I could say, oh, okay, I see that. Um, my students really like getting results and seeing the results and exciting about, they're excited about the results, so I can have them share that with each other. But I can see they really don't like problem solving. They're really uncomfortable with that. So I might want to focus on that aspect to get them more comfortable with the problem solving part. So with this matrix, they're, he's, they're assessing the, um, uh, students' feelings and comparing it across. So that's what a matrix is good for. With more complicated survey ins tools online, we're seeing other kinds of surveys. So I'll, these are all examples of rank surveys where people can drag and drop information to move it along, around. So not only do we have surveys uh, these days that can mimic the sort of textual, act, the, not textual, the um, writing aspect of an old form, but something that's more tactile where they can move things around um, physically and decide what it is they like or don't like. So this top one, they can move them up and down. Here they can drag the tiny text into the box, and these are sliders that go across. And the final question we're going to cover is how. How are we going to do these surveys? Let's start with the fun thing, the survey tools. Who here has used Google Forms before to do a survey? SurveyMonkey, Lime Survey, and Qualtrics. Couple of Qualtrics users. I'll do, uh, for those of you who haven't, I'll do a few demos so you can see what some of the possibilities are. And that's why we did it this way. So, again, tiny, tiny text. Last year, I was working on a survey that I needed to do. I'm the chair of CSSIS, uh, Computing Service Special Interest Section of the American Association of Law Libraries. And one of my jobs as chair was to find out who wanted to be in what committee, subcommittee for the, the uh, SIS, the special interest section. And I started to play with SurveyMonkey and try to come up with this whole thing to ask people what they wanted to do. And in about 10 minutes, I got really frustrated. It wasn't the right tool. So then I went to Google Forms, which is free, easy to use, and it took five minutes because Google Forms lets you create a quick survey. I added a text entry for a name, an email address, the names of the committees, like an example on title question below to show that it's really simple. And if I wanted to add another thing, I would click add item. And you can see I can add all the different kinds of survey questions we've been talking about. The open text, multiple choice or check boxes, choose from a drop down list so I could have someone pick from a whole list. I can even do a rating scale, so all the sample question, and it just puts in a little form for me to type out. Sample, do you like it? Done. And now there's a rating scale about what they can pick. They can only pick one from one to five, but they get to decide the rating. So that's a simple way. If you haven't created a survey before, you're looking for a place to get started, don't want to spend any money, play with Google Forms for a few minutes. SurveyMonkey is what we've uh, used in our library for years. I think this is like some sample survey that I dug up from 2004 or five, maybe 2006, that uh, we were playing with when we first started using SurveyMonkey and we wanted to show what people could do with it. SurveyMonkey is an online survey instrument. You can use a very limited version for free, um, 10 questions, 100 respondents. And for $200 a year, you get most of the features for SurveyMonkey. Unlimited questions, unlimited respondents, uh, the ability to save all your surveys online. The, you can share your SurveyMonkey login with anyone in your institution, which is great, but also a problem. Because after time, we got lots of different surveys, and lots of, we had to eventually cut down the people who had the login because we didn't want everyone reading all the results of the surveys. Um, but it's pretty easy to use, and it can create all your standard survey questions, multiple choice. View them all at once. So view all pages. And here they're showing some examples of what you can do. You can see it's so old. They're asking if you're using a 28.8 modem. Is anyone here still using a 28.8 modem? 
Okay, so I wouldn't, that would not be a good example of writing good questions, an answer that goes nowhere. And some satisfied questions. If I want to edit it, there's three tabs on top, one that lets me, you can see no one's taken the survey, so there's no results. But if there were, it could be, I could get a chart. I can design the survey just by clicking design. And I can add lots of different kinds of questions. And it gives me a large, large range to choose from. It even gives me sets of questions. So let's say I have a survey, and every survey I'm asking basic demographic information. It provides me that right off the bat. And I can decide which of these I want to use. And I'm done. Oh, I've got to name it. Please answer. And there's all the demographic information. For those of you who use SurveyMonkey, what's your favorite thing about SurveyMonkey? Yeah, that's a nice feature. So in Analyze Results, there's a shared responses. And I can enable sharing and decide what it even is. And I'm going to, you know, you can just see the responses, a general summary, summary include the open-ended responses or more. What's your least favorite thing about SurveyMonkey? Downloading the results. Yeah, to download the results, you have to click, I want to download the results. And then you get an email later. What's yours? Yeah, that's kind of annoying too. Yeah, then the 10 limit question. My least favorite thing about SurveyMonkey is I find it really clicky. So if I want to add a question, you saw I clicked, I went to a box, I did some stuff in the box, it came back. So it keeps taking me away from my survey, and I have to keep coming back to it. I'm not really seeing my survey as a whole. So that's one thing I don't like. Yep? <laughs> of surveys to the extent, you know, because so many people, even if they've never given one, have taken it. So I've got an administrator uh, in our law school who insists it can't possibly be a survey if I don't administer that survey. <laughs> Bonnie, are you going to add something? Yeah. Okay. So, yeah, there's, there's some issues with SurveyMonkey. But for $200 a year, it is a pretty good bargain. Um, if you need more advanced features, then SurveyMonkey is going to make you pay. For example, um, you know, you got faculty, they've created a survey, and now they want to download it and put it in one of those really sophisticated um, data analysis programs. So if I click all responses collected and I want to download in SPSS format, oh, that's a feature that's going to cost me a lot of money. So some features, it used to be that $200 got you everything, but now they've, they've got a couple more levels that one's $300 and one I think is $800 to en enable the advanced features. There is another uh, survey called um, Lime Survey. And here I'm doing Lime Service. And this is free. I was reading Technoids, and really nicely, someone asked, what kinds of survey software do you use? And a bunch of Technoids all posted, we really like Lime Survey. Um, and this is Lime Service, which is based on Lime Survey. So I can get you over to the original Lime Survey at limesurvey.org. And this is uh, something you can download and install on a server. You can administer different user groups. So they can, you can have different people with different logins. It can handle all kinds of questions, just like we saw from Google Forms, the more we saw on, on SurveyMonkey, and I think even a few more. If you just want to try it out, you can click here and try the Lime service, which is what I've been doing. And so log in. I got to log in, and now I want to play. And this is what we see. Um, this is what a typical Lime service uh, site looks like. And I'm sure this can do a lot of things, but I got very quickly frustrated by all these icons because I couldn't always figure out what they all did. So, no. 
Yeah. So I would come here and I'd say, okay, all right, I want to start a survey. What do I do? Um, this home thing, I'm not sure where it goes. Key, that uh, doesn't seem to do anything. This is a grid, uh, edit label sets. Let's do this over here. Oh, okay. I can create a survey. Let's get started. And it gives you a form. For the most part, it's pretty good. It's got like uh, a little version of Microsoft Word that you can do um, nice descriptions and a welcome message and an end message. Test again, again. And I can save it. So getting the survey started is good. But now I wasn't sure what to do next. I clearly have to add question groups and I need to add questions. But does anyone see where I need to go to add a question group? Hmm? Some what? Hints? Heads. Okay, let's try the heads. Uh, heads are token management. I don't even know what token management is. I'm going to leave that alone. Uh, let's try this plus again because, you know, over here I started a survey. Oh, the same plus, now I add a group. The librarians are now screaming because we now have an icon that looks the same that does different things. So now I add a group of questions. So I haven't even added a question yet. So group one. I bet. Okay. Uh, and now I want to add a question. Where do I go now? The same thing. Okay. And now I can add a question. I'm not sure what a code is. I type my question. This is my question. And let's say I decide I want to make this question um, a five-point short. No, five-point short. I want it to be a, a radio list. And I scroll down. Okay, now I want to put in my list. Is it under advanced settings? No, there's some great advanced settings here, though. Lots of stuff about how I can display it. If I have an other option, I can rename it. It doesn't have to be other. I can decide even the level of the SPSS scale. If anyone knows what that is, then that's the level of control. It gives you a lot of control. And I can see why a lot of the IT folk who are doing this got really excited over this, because you get a lot of control. You can do what you want. But if, like I said, if Emily said, if I handed this off to a faculty, they'd be confused. Because at this point, I still haven't put in a list. So I'll save the question. Oh, I've got to enter a code. It doesn't even tell me what the code is. I'll try 2,222. Save the question. And now I've got to edit the answer options. All right, so that previews the question. There, that edits it. So now I've done several different steps to do one question. So I can do a lot. It's really powerful, but um, it's not going to be an easy service for someone to use. But it's free and worth trying out if it works for you and your institution. You said you use, uh, was it you who said you used Lime uh, Survey? What do you use it for? A lot of things, uh, performance surveys. Uh the library and, you know, it, and school administration. The other thing that we do um, that I use it for is um, uh, working with students to do uh, FBA officer elections and things like that. We run a lot of elections on it. Um, and most recently, we put out a big exit survey for our graduates. So it can do lots of different kinds of surveys, but how many people can use it? Um, not many. I do most of them. <laughs> Seems like it would be a lot of fun after a while. You had a question? Really? Okay. So, yeah, for our faculty, this is not how, that doesn't fit how they think, so they were looking for another solution. So a few months ago, one of our faculty members came up to us and said, I found something new. We've got to take a look at it. It's like Survey Monkey on steroids. So I said, okay, we'll take a look. And what he found was Qualtrics. Oh, I'm still logged in. Yeah. And... Go to my surveys. Qualtrics is another online survey instrument. Um, and like Lime Survey, it's really powerful. You can organize people in groups so you, people can get logins, but they don't have access to all their, uh, each other's surveys. You can do all kinds of weird and interesting and well, interestingly organized surveys with Qualtrics. I will say, however, it's not cheap. Um, 
and you know, the Survey Monkey may cost you oh, $200, but Qualtrics costs in the thousands. But the our faculty members who have used it so far really like it, and they like it for two reasons. Uh, one, they like the interface. So let's take a look at um, let's take a look at the Law School Educational Technologist Survey because that's a pretty basic one. No, let me go back to that one actually. Let's take a look at the. Hey, I want to switch surveys. I will go here. If I was doing this in SurveyMonkey, I'd have to go back and forth. But here, I can just grab and say, create a formal group. And this is the kind of survey that just takes me minutes. It's a short survey. And if I want to create something, then I just click Create a New Item. And it appears right there on the page. There's no thing like SurveyMonkey that I don't like going back and forth. It's there. And all the tools I want to work with are also right here. So this is multiple choice. I can decide how many questions or answers I want. There's automatic choices. OK, well, it's not letting me change it because this is a different survey. But there are automatic choices so that so I think we're used here. All right, fine. That people can choose. So instead of typing out every single time a whole range of disagree to agree, those are included within them. I really like it. I want to show it. Automatic choices. All these are available. Dislike, dislike. Will not, will not. Uh, effective, ineffective. Worse, better. Large ranges, you can make them smaller ranges. I personally don't like ones that are seven like that. So let's me make smaller. Say five would be a little better. And all I did was click the minus sign. Qualtrics took care of it for me. I start typing. Um, did you see that movie? Let's hope Qualtrics does it for me. And it knows, because I start with did, that yes, no is what I want. Faculty love this. This is intuitive. They get it. They can see what they want to do. Um, they want to do something that has a number, and they want to make sure that it has a number. They are very interested in validating the data, so making sure the data that you get is in the right format. How many? Now I want to change the question type. Qualtrics gives me lots of different kinds of question types, your standard tables um, and text entry. Plus, they added a lot of cute little things, including um, a heat map where you can put an image and say, well, what here do you respond? And it'll generate a heat map. I'll do this as a text entry. And I want it to limit to numbers. And the validation's right here next to where I'm working. Content validation is a number all in one place. The other thing they really like about this is they keep coming up with like all these different ways they want to ask questions. So one said, okay, here's what I want to do. I've got this um, research I want to do. I want to see how people respond to a particular scenario and see if, if I change the facts of the scenario if they respond a different way. So I want half the people who get the survey to see one scenario, half the people to get another scenario. But then later in the survey, I want them to answer the questions. Um, if they saw the first scenario, they should answer this one set. And if they saw the second scenario, they should answer the other set. Yeah, that took a little while to figure out how to do. Qualtrics could handle it, and they were really happy. And it handles it using something called survey flow, which we used in the Law School Educational Technologist Survey, where, again, we gave you a set of questions, and then later in the survey, we wanted you to see different other questions depending on how you answered. And survey flow, we said, okay, if you didn't have really educational technologists in the survey, we wanted to end the survey, and that was it for you, and you saw one ending. If you war did have the educational technologists we wanted to talk about, then we uh, ended the survey again at the end of the survey, and then we sent you to another page. So we sent you to another survey. Qualtrics could handle that. And we asked questions like, all right, do you have someone who handles pro uh, project management? And if you did, then we wanted to send you to the project management questions. And we want to do that over and over and over again. And there's different ways you can arrange surveys with some of the other inst uh, survey instruments I've played to do things like this, but I found it a lot easier here with Qualtrics. So the intuitiveness of Qualtrics is something that we've really responded to and like. A um, couple things that are not as good as Qualtrics, one, of course, is the price. 
Two, it may be because I've used Qualtrics a lot more recently. I've helped faculty a lot, but occasionally I run into weird bugs, which I don't like. Like, um, we found an instance where uh, someone wanted something validated by numbers, and sometimes it wouldn't let people put in commas, and sometimes it would. So if they were putting in a million, they would kick them out for putting in commas, or they wouldn't, and that's something Qualtrics is working with. If I was going to say my favorite thing about Qualtrics, the tech support has been wonderful. When I get those weird questions from the faculty, I may try to ponder it for a few minutes, but I got other things to do. I call tech support and they say, oh yeah, we can do that. That's simple. And within minutes, they've walked me through it. So we've been really happy to have they responded. For those of you who have Qualtrics, what is your favorite thing about it? Yeah, the whole up Emily was talking about an uploading media situation where the faculty member had wanted someone to upload, um, uh, wanted the respondents to upload a picture and then later see different pictures. And the Qualtrics engineers said, okay, we're going to make that happen, even though the instrument wasn't originally designed to do that. So that's been really helpful. Any least favorites? Meg? Right. And there's some things you can change, but then you've got to get uh, complicated. Uh, for example, if you want to change how um, some standard language might be worded, like they could have a standard warning that you've entered the wrong information, sometimes it's easy to change aspects about that. Other times you have to use JavaScript. So. But another thing I do like about it is you can build up a library over time of questions and surveys, and they've got some standard ones already that you can grab. But my very favorite thing about Qualtrics is the collaboration feature. Uh, I, if I want to share something on SurveyMonkey, I have to give them a login. Uh, and they, or I can share the results, like you mentioned, which is great, but I can't share the survey itself. With Qualtrics, I can create a survey, and then I can share it with lots of different people. So this is the group that we were working on, uh, the survey for the educational technologists. And I said, I want your input, and I want you to be able to write on the survey, too. So I said, yeah, I want you to edit and view the results. You can copy of it. I didn't want, only wanted one person activating or deactivating it or distributing it. And they were uh, able to handle that. Uh, this was able to handle that quite well. We were all able to work together. So that's another thing that we liked about it. Um, you, Qualtrics does have a free version. You can try. You can see how it works. And you can see there's a lot more different things we didn't even get into. Uh, for example, fun ways to distribute the survey, including for, uh, through any, almost any kind of social media. SurveyMonkey has something similar. And a way to keep track of through email history about who's responded to your survey and who hasn't. And that's something that some of our users have appreciated too. Has lots of different ways to view the results. Here I've created different reports. We have uh, we included some of our test results in the uh, survey because um, we weren't sure if some of them were, were actual, meant to be actual results. But I created one that started for post start of survey. And when I look at the results, I get lots and lots and lots of fun graphs. You'll see more of them later. And it tries, if you're doing numerical analysis, it tries to give you some good information right off. Yep? I'm looking, I'm looking at the website, and you have to request a quote, so I assume it's like super expensive. It is a little unexpected. Is it, is it an side. annual a debate that happened? And our administrator, the dean of administration of finance, is sitting right there. <laughs> uh, oh, I but there was a lot John of discussion was among uh, a library director, and the dean, and and uh, or sorry, the vice president of administration of finance. 
um, and uh, Dawn to see what was going to be done. But because faculty had such a strong interest, we were able to get start off with this a, a base package, and we started off with that. Just is it an annual charge? Or it is, is an it? annual charge. So, yeah. yeah. Particularly faculty had projects they wanted to use right now. So right now I've got faculty who are actively using this, plus I've got um, a lot of different other departments who are actively using this to gather data that they need for their jobs and for the benefit of the law school. So you know, seeing that there was going to be a cost benefit in the long term helped a lot. These are responses for text responses. I can view individual ones, plus I can download um, everything into a Word, PDF, even PowerPoint, if I wanted to create a PowerPoint on the fly. Uh, of course, it can also download into uh, your standard CSV Excel file. And it does come with the SPSS built in. Again, something the faculty were very interested in because they wanted it for their analysis later. All right. So, so far, Qualtrics has led to happy faculty. How does a respondent take a survey, or how does a, uh, the writer interact with it? Different ways you can distribute it. Hey. I can send out a link. One thing SurveyMonkey does do is it lets you customize this link. Here in Qualtrics, you can't. But we just create bit.ly links at that point, or some other URL shortener. You can manage a whole, uh, your email through Qualtrics itself. So it sends it out. And like I said, then it's keeping track of who's responded, who hasn't. So if you have people who haven't responded, it can handle that. And you can do things like in-page pop-ups. So it gives you lots of different ways. The survey director is another way to manage all that. I'm not as familiar with that because I haven't used it. Some of our faculty have to distribute uh, surveys to different groups, and they've liked it a lot. You can customize look and you can customize you don't customize look and feel here, but you can customize look and feel of your survey uh, under create a survey or not create uh, edit wrong one. Um, this may not this one probably won't let me edit it, but if I go to one of the tests, click look and feel. Oh, this one here I was, I was saying okay. One of the other fun things about Qualtrics is it comes up with mobile versions, so this one look, would look good on an iPhone. Plus, I can pick a bunch of different themes, but if I've already got my own CSS, I can put it in there. So if you really want to customize it on that granular level, you have the ability to do so. For us, uh, it was enough that when we got Qualtrics, we branded it with our logo. Um, just a couple other points. Uh, one other thing that the how issue is how we're going to get people to respond to our survey. Some are obvious. If you're doing a particular group, uh, you know who they are. You can do an email list. If you're working with people in person and doing the in-person surveys, you can get a uh, focus group together. But a lot of our faculty lately have been working with panels uh, because they want to talk to very specific groups of people. And they've got uh, two different ways they can do that. The one that they've chosen is to use Mechanical Turk. Has anyone used Mechanical Turk? It's an interesting service from Amazon. Here's what it does. You've got two groups of people. First group of people are someone who has what they call a human intelligence task or a hit. 
and they want to pay people to do this task. It's a task that a computer can't do, but a human can. Say, take a survey, and they may pay anything from a few cents to a few dollars to have each person do that. Then there's the other group, people who are willing to do those tasks, and they'll sign up through Amazon to do that. Amazon tries to vet to make sure that it's not spam bots are doing that. Um, and also, our faculty have also added a few validation questions to make sure they're getting good responses. They'll send it out to Mechanical Turk um, for, say, a couple bucks per survey, and then they'll get a couple of hundred responses right away, which is why I mentioned that timing thing earlier, because if they send it out at the end of the day, then they got Eastern Hemisphere respondents, and if they send it out at the beginning, they got Western Hemisphere respondents, and they were very interested in that. But they've been happy with this service, and they've used it for quite a few surveys, particularly because the price is right and something that they can control and set. The other option is many of the survey instruments, like Qualtrics and like SurveyMonkey, use survey panels. Has anyone done one of these panels yet or uh, bought into one yet? Again, they're not cheap, but they're part of a cost that a lot of faculty members factor into their surveys, into their research costs. And Qualtrics, for example, will offer, um, if you don't care who you're responding from, it's just the general public, you, they'll say, okay, pay us $5 to respond in, and uh, we'll set up a panel for you, minimum cost of 600 from what they were saying. Or they'll set up, if you want a very specific set of respondents, you remember I had the faculty who said, okay, I want women administrative assistants from Chicago law firms. If you have things that are that specific, they had another way of getting it, but if they want something that specific, then uh, that will cost you more money, let's say $15 a person. But still, it's a th the faculty then get to decide what they need, and there's a service that lets them get it. Finally, just a little bit about analyzing data, but uh, to point out that's a whole other question. Uh, if you've got, you know, you've set up your questions, we've been focusing on setting up really good questions to get really good data, but it's going to take some amount of expertise to analyze it to make sure it's okay. A lot of us, of course, use Excel, but I'm seeing more faculty use the uh, sophisticated analysis software. So you'll hear terms like SAS, the sigma is from SPSS, which we've seen a couple of different times a day, or STATA. None of these are cheap but they can do really high-level analysis if people know what we're, uh, they're doing. And I think there's going to be a more of a call in uh, libraries and IT to understand what those programs are, so that a, a, would be good for a future program. Has anyone used those? Which one? <laughs> it's not fun. And finally, of course, people want to find a way to present the data, to visualize it. And, of course, in lots of different ways. People come up with fun graphs. Apparently, this graph compares the number of times the Mets versus the Yankees were mentioned in the New York Times. So it's kind of hard to see what you're doing there. We've got infographics, uh, like this one I stole from Mashable. Um, but I don't know of a good way to create this. But if you're looking for something to uh, sort of do an interesting kind of infographic on the fly, you'll see a lot of these Wordle. Who here has played with Wordle? It's another fun thing to do with your text. So recently the library did a survey and we asked our students, what do you use the labs for, the computer labs for? What do they use the computer labs for? Anyone see? Uh, because what they've done is that the word that was mentioned the most is the biggest and they use it to print or they use it rarely, depending. Um, but we can now graphically see, yeah, that's why they're going to the labs. So a few takeaway points to finish this off. Um, the reason why I wanted to come here and talk to you about surveys is I really think they're going to be more important. We're going to be doing a lot more of them, and they're going to come to us for our expertise. So I thought we'd start to figure out ways to build up a common X set of expertise. Uh, the other thing is, is when you're creating surveys, always keeping that question in why. Why am I asking this question? Why um, am I asking these people? Why am I doing the survey now as opposed to some other time? Or why am I doing a survey at all? Uh, if for the part of the survey that's in our control, the one part I recommend that everybody spend the most amount of time on is testing. Make sure that your answers make sense to the audience who, or your questions make sense to the audience who is getting them. Know your IRB and what's expected of them. Only a few of you I know have experience with it, but it's going to be more prevalent in the future, particularly as we start to see law reviews make more demands that the research gets vetted through IRB. And of course, choose the right tool for the right job. I spent, as I said, I spent 20 minutes on a Survey Monkey survey when I could have spent five minutes on Google Forms and gotten the same thing done in less time. I've created a pearl tree with uh, some of the resources I used for that. Looks like this. I always like playing with things online. I did one on law schools and empirical research. 
which has some of my, the sites that I found. You click to see the site. But my favorite thing about this particular tool, if I click this one, come on. I see a lot of research other people have done along the same lines that might also be useful. So that's why I chose to put my resource list on Pearl Tree. So you can only see the things that I found. You can see all the things everyone else found that could be useful too. So, and the Pearl Tree is right there. And I'll put links up on this session's page. Any last minute questions? Okay. Um, we had a problem with our, <clears throat> our, our student exit survey um, that became noticeable as, as we started looking at response rates. And one of the things that Lime does is uh, indicate how many people dump the survey without completing it. And we were in double digits uh, on that. Do you, do you have a benchmark for uh, if you can see that for when you're in trouble? Um, I think it depends on the survey. Some surveys you expect people to dump without completing it. Some, like the educational technology survey, was designed to dump with people without completing it because we were trying to vet out certain people. But